really appreciate you joining us today. Um, if you could tell us a little about yourself, and then I'll introduce the other folks here. I'll do some housekeeping, and we'll get on into it. Uh, but Bo, thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, here, I, I'll just pull up the slide real quick that has says everything about me. <laughs> yeah. Make it a little easier. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so I, I work at Black Hills Information Security. Um, I've been there for almost nine years now and uh, have, have pretty much kind of run the entire gamut of penetration tests uh, for, for multiple organizations. So um, if you think like standard external assessments, internal assessments, wireless, you know, web apps, physicals, you name it. And for the last like three, maybe four-ish years, I've been exclusively doing uh, red team engagements and cloud assessments. So um, highly uh, just focused on cloud security uh, for the last few years. So I ended up writing a class uh, that's called Breaching the Cloud. Um, and, and that class is basically built uh, around the idea of how do, we, how do we get initial access to organizations? How do we um, exfiltrate data? How do we um, escalate privileges in cloud environments? Um, and a, a lot of today's content comes straight from my class. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the, basically like where I'm like living right now when it comes to uh, pen testing and teaching. Um, done a number of talks. I, I develop tools as well. So I'll talk about a few of the, the various tools um, that I use on a daily basis um, today yeah. as well. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. <laughs> Thanks, Bo. And for those out there, just kind of, I want this to be interactive today. So um, please, uh, I'll keep out my best as I can, my eye on chat. Um, the next person I want to introduce is Charles or Chip Buck, the CTO of SAS Alerts, who's going to be doing some banter here with Bo. Um, uh, Chip, you bring a wealth of knowledge both from both the MSP's perspective as well as somebody that now has built a, a tremendous application. Um, tell us a little about yourself, Chip, and uh, thanks for joining. Yeah, I've been um, <clears throat> working in the, the SMB computing space as an MSP now for over 25 years. Um, also have built um, a previous software company that was focused on um, automation for virtualized applications, virtualized desktops. Um, that technology got incorporated into so many things that Microsoft now does with their virtual desktop offering and, uh, and NetApps. So we've, we've had some good success. My operating theory around security has, has really can be boiled down really simply. And that is this, that the thing that hackers are after is the mundane stuff. It's the Excel files, the PDFs, and the Word documents. Um, and our job as um, security professionals, as technologists, is really to protect users from their own mistakes. Um, and that's both education um, and active protection. So um, that's how I focus the tools that we've built over time to try and put people behind as tight a wall as they can. You know, it's always a battle between um, security and availability um, between the business users who need applications and data um, and need to share them around the world and hackers are trying to get their hands on them. So, you know, our mission has always been to try and help people find the easiest path to stay in the lane of safety. Yeah, very cool. Um, thanks, Chip, for doing that. Um, okay. Um, and then, Michelle, just looking real quick at housekeeping, are we all set? Can they answer and ask questions? Or can they ask questions now? Are we good there? Uh, it looks like they can ask questions, chat. Okay. I'm, I'm working on chat, but they can Okay, ask perfect. So we're working on that. Jim, uh, thanks for sponsoring this. Um, just a quick about yourself, and we'll get on into it here. Yeah, I'm the least important person on this webinar, that's for sure. So I've been in the MSP space ecosystem for 20 years. Uh, the, the first decade was as an MSP at a company called Thrive Networks, sold that to Staples. And then the last decade has been in the MSP software ecosystem. Right with companies like Independence IT, Kaseya, and now SAS Alerts. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you, Andrew. This was actually this webinar was your idea, and get, bringing Bo in uh, was you know through you. So we really appreciate what you're what you're doing in terms of not just this webinar, but the thought leadership that you bring to this entire industry. I don't think that there's enough people that realize. You know, obviously, people see you now on the cyber call and, you know, you lead Cyber Nation, um, but I hope people recognize 
that you are at the forefront of a lot of security initiatives uh, for this community. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Jim. No, I much appreciate it. Okay. And then Michelle, thanks for on the marketing side for being here with us as well. Um, this webinar is recorded, Michelle, correct? And they will, whether they attended or not, they will get a recording uh, back and, and a follow-up email, fair? That's correct. Exactly. Yeah. And chat awesome. is up for everyone. So. All right. And chat Get is good. up. So in, in if you've attended a cyber call, even though we're not using that format, please, please I'll keep my best eye on chat uh, and, and interrupt this see fit. So, Bo, I'm going to tee you up here. Um, this thing called Azure uh, and O365 um, used just maybe a little bit these days, right? Um, so, you know, I love the way you start off most of your podcasts or webinars around this, but why Azure? You know, maybe you could start there. Yeah, so so why Azure? Uh, I actually have a slide for that too. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, you, honestly, so we, we do, um, like I said, a number of penetration tests, number of red team assessment, assessments for many different types of organizations, whether it be, um, healthcare providers, law firms, uh, government agencies, and the majority of them tend to leverage Azure to some extent. And I would say top, I would say like maybe like even like 85 to 90% of our customers are using O365 specifically. Um, and so we see it all the time. And as an external attacker, um, it becomes one of the first things that we're exposed to for an organization. So it's it, it really is that initial footprint that says, hey, um, here's a, a good place to start as an attacker, uh, because it is something that is exposed externally in most cases. Yeah, well, and I should probably jump the gun there because I know I saw your, I love the way you say roadmap instead of agenda. Maybe you want to jump back oh, one sure. and kind of yeah, yeah. Sh share kind of where you want to take us today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this this uh, this slide deck, um, I initially initially built for for a view, viewpoint of Azure from a pen testing perspective. However, um, that being said, um, as we go through a lot of the topics today, um, I will try to, sh to, to speak to how they should be addressed from almost like a blue team and also configuration perspective. Uh, so from a best practice perspective, like what are the things that attackers are looking at, attack or looking at um, from an identification of attack surface uh, first, uh, first off. Secondly, how are they doing recon? Um, so what? So if you if you were to say, "Hey, Bo, come attack my my cloud environment today," what what are some of the first things I'm going to do um, from a recon perspective to get an idea what what to even attack? Um, what are some external attacks I would even try? And then um, we'll talk about authentication because to me, when it comes to a lot of mistakes that customers make. Um, it tends to be around configuration with authentication. So um, we'll talk heavily about conditional access today. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about post-compromise. Um, I don't know how, how deep we'll get into it uh, from, for a timing perspective, but um, we, can, we can definitely um, try to cover as much as we can. Uh, so one thing, you know, you mentioned it, Andrew, uh, mm -hmm. like questions for sure, like jump in and ask questions. Um, otherwise I'll just talk for the hour and uh, we'll see where we get. Uh, but yeah. I, you know, making it interactive, any questions you guys have, um, Jim, Chip, like, please jump in, um, ask me anything you want, and uh, we can derail as much as yeah. you want. <laughs> yeah, and and Bo, as you, as you kick things off, I love how you kind of frame things up, because it's so critical as MSPs, right, you know, they hear a lot about, do this, do that, buy this tool, buy that tool. But you're coming at it, and this is what we do with Right of Boom, right? We journey through the lens of the threat actor. What is the threat actor going to do? And then what defenses do we build so that, because at the end of the day, an MSP has to look at what the attacker is doing, build their capabilities, and take them to market. So I appreciate how you're going to present this, because that's really, as MSPs, we, we've got the hardest job, and it's not just for one company, it's for many, many, many yeah, companies for sure. So, uh, absolutely. So, uh, do you want to dive in? Let's get yeah, started. Let's talk about attack surface. I think this is really awesome the way you start out here. So when it comes to attack surface, um, there's, there's really, in my view, three ways to look at a cloud environment first off externally, right? So what can be seen from the outside, um, as an unauthenticated attacker, what can I attack from a public resource perspective? Um, are there any misconfigurations there? Secondly, internal. So there's two different viewpoints in which we as attackers look at an internal network. First off, 
um, resource-based access. So meaning, have I compromised a virtual machine? Like, have I found an exploit for a piece of software that is running on a, uh, an externally exposed system, right? So let's say that you had a web server. If I were to compromise that host, what could I attack internal within your cloud environments uh, from that host? And then thirdly, API access. So this is the one that becomes really, really interesting when we start to look at what can an attacker do with credentials when they're authenticated to an API? So um, this can look like a few different things. It could look like a standard um, uh, employee's credentials who've been compromised via phishing. Uh, and, and as an attacker, we're leveraging some of the Azure APIs to authenticate, to enumerate various resources and other users. Um, or uh, it can look like a service principal credential um, that maybe was exposed in, um, let's say, like a code repository. And we'll talk about some of those, those ways that those credentials get exposed as well. But realistically, um, I, I try to look at any cloud environment from these three perspectives, outside, internal resource to resource, and then API perspective. Because via the API, you can actually see configuration issues that you might not see when you're looking at it from a specific resources uh, point of view. Um, one big thing that I like to try to make as clear as I possibly can is that there's, there's two different services within Azure that commonly get grouped together. Um, Microsoft 365, right? So the very, very common productivity suite, and then you have Azure infrastructure. Now, both of these have actual, um, they, they have two separate APIs and they are in fact uh, segmented off when it comes to access control. So at the heart of both of them, you have Azure Active Directory that tends to drive where the permissions are, are being pulled from. Um, but oftentimes, um, attackers, if we were to compromise a, you know, a, um, a typical employee's credentials via phishing, um, or maybe we, we've guessed their password, oftentimes that standard employee's credentials don't have access to a lot of the infrastructure. And that's because of the nature of how um, Azure infrastructure is actually segmented off from Microsoft 365. So um, as we kind of go through today, try to keep in mind that if we're talking about Microsoft 365, we're typically just talking about productivity suite, um, things like Outlook, things like SharePoint's, uh, uh, SharePoint uh, services teams. Um, and if we're talking about Azure infrastructure, we're talking about um, what is known in the Azure environment as Azure Resource Manager. And that's where the subscriptions lie, uh, where you, know, you can spin up things like virtual machines, databases, storage, that kind of stuff. Bo, do you, do you when you start to do your, um, you know, rec you know, I know you're gonna go recon next, but are you looking for hybrid environments? Like, is that an important piece, you know, as to be able to jump back? And, and is that something that people need to keep in mind as they shift workloads up that you're gonna try to ideally maybe jump back onto their, you know, internal networks out of the cloud? Yeah, so that, that kind of comes up a little bit when we start to look at um, the recon side. Um, to, to answer your question specifically though, that tends to be something that we identify after the fact, after getting access to a credential, right? Got so um, in, in a lot of cases, if we were to get access to a credential in a hybrid environment, we would have to then determine, well, is this hybrid environment something that I can leverage to only access cloud resources, or can I somehow ride that access down to on-prem? Um, and it. in some cases, depending on how Azure is set up, whether um, you know, they're leveraging various VPN services or they're leveraging things like Express Route, uh, to connect on-prem data centers to the cloud, uh, there may be some connectivity there. Got it. Got um, it. But during recon, one of the things that we can identify is uh, the usage of ADFS um, or the usage usage of um, Azure just natively managing their infrastructure. And uh, so there's two URLs that we use in recon um, very often, and these are these are these these two that we have on the screen here. Um, so the first one is the this uh, MicrosoftOnline.com uh, get user realm .srf, uh, URL. So using this URL, um, you can see there's a, a login parameter, right? Where I have equals username at acmecomputercompany.com. Now, this is a public URL that anyone can can access. If you change the domain name on that to an email address, and it doesn't even have to be a real user at the company, it just has to have the the proper domain name. Um, you will get a screen back that looks similar to uh, what's on the screenshot here. And what it will tell you is if that organization is leveraging um, Azure for a managed directory perspective, or if they're actually leveraging um, a federated environment, so ADFS. And it will actually point you to where that ADFS uh, URL is as well. So this is something from a recon perspective, right up front, we can say, all right, this organization's using ADFS and this is where their authentication portal is. 
or um, they're just leveraging managed Azure authentication. The second URL is a way for us to actually gather tenant IDs. Now, in most cases, the tenant ID isn't all that useful. Um, what is useful is if we were to compromise a service principal credential. And in a lot of cases, um, that might be something we find in like a piece of code, right? Um, because service principles tend to be leveraged from a like an API-based authentication to carry out various purposes uh, within Azure. And in order to authenticate as a service principal, uh, you do have to have the tenant ID. So that second URL will help you get the, uh, the tenant ID. Username enumeration is something that is another big topic for us as attackers, because we need to, um, if we're going to perform any sort of password attacks, we have to have a good user list. And in general, when we start attacks, one of the things we, we will do is we'll try to enumerate as many employee names as possible through, th through sites like LinkedIn um, and various other tools that uh, can help us gather employee names. And then we'll try to mingle that into a list of uh, actual employee email addresses. And there have you know, been a number of different username enumeration vulnerabilities over the years. And one of them um, that is still there is, uh, is this Microsoft login uh, Microsoft.com slash common slash OAuth2 token URL. So this is actually where authentication happens for, uh, for Azure in most cases. So whenever you go to log in with the browser, this is a uh, URL that gets hit with the, the web request during that authentication process. And that endpoint is actually extremely verbose and will tell you a lot of information about users, um, especially if you have a, uh, a valid credential. So, um, so this particular URL, first off, it'll tell you if a username exists or not. Secondly, um, it will actually describe whether or not MFA is enabled for that user or not, and if it's third-party MFA or if it's Microsoft MFA. So it's very easy for us to go and identify, hey, I have a valid credential. However, there's MFA for this user. And maybe it's Microsoft, maybe it's something else, as well as a number of different conditional access policies as well. Um, so I have a script that, uh, that I'll show here in a second. I think I talk about it a little bit more when we get to password spraying, but- um, oh, wait, yep. wait, As you bring that up, I'm just curious, are there any, you know, as an MSP, are there any deception techniques, honey, a, a la honeypot, if you will, probably poor choice of words here, but knowing you're trying this as an attacker, are there things I can do to go, this, this is not my internal company looking for this stuff? Yep, yeah, so that's a great, that's an absolutely great question. Um, so on the prevention side, um, when I get to talking about password attacks, I'll talk about something called uh, smart lockout that tends to be a good place to start. Um, but in addition to that, yes, absolutely. Deception tactics um, are great uh, for any, any, sort of, any sort of environment where attackers are going to be trying to access credentials, right? Um, the key thing to keep in mind, though, is even with deception, um, if I'm rotating IP addresses, it becomes, it becomes hard to, to it. say like, Hey, this authentication that happened on my, my canary user over here, um, actually matches up with this other valid login that happened in a, in a similar time. So there are ways to kind of help with that. Um, but I would say in general, um, more of the preventative measures towards preventing compromise. So, you know, strong password policies, MFA, um, those tend to be better places to start. Got it. Got it. So, Bo, this is Jim here, just in terms of like layman's terms. So far, what we've seen is essentially someone's got the phone book, right? And they can see your phone number and where you live. So far, they just don't have the security code and the keys to the house yet. Is that, is <laughs> yeah, that fair? That's, that's a that's a decent uh, way to look at it. Yeah. Um, so I would I would almost argue that the the phone book hasn't been accessed yet, but more the uh, uh, like a couple pages out of it, right? Like, okay. got it. <laughs> like, okay. So, so us as attackers, you got to keep in mind, like we don't typically have access to a directory, right? So we mm -hmm. don't have access to the entire directory of users externally. So what happens is us as attackers, we have to uh, go and do recon and say, all right, um, here's all the people that, you know, say they worked at this company on LinkedIn, right? And that list tends to be much smaller than um, the actual organization's list, right? Right. Um, but what we end up doing, and I'll show, I'll show you this in here, here in a second, um, after we password spray an account, any, any account, if it's a single account, um, that provides access to the rest of that directory. And then, yes, from there, we'd have the phone book, right? <laughs> Got it. And I guess, you know, I'm old enough to remember phone books. <laughs> yeah, so Jim, 
what Bo's describing here is something we see a lot in SAS alerts. We see the signature of a password spray attack, and it will be lots of unknown actors that are probing, and the credentials are incorrect. Um, and we'll see that evolve to the point where they figure out, hey, this company uses the format, you know, first initial dot last name plus at domain name. And now they've got the LinkedIn list. They figured out one of those, whether it's, you know, Jim Lippy at SouthWorks.com or Jim.Lippy or J.Lippy, whatever it is. Well, most administrators have this very interesting habit of once they set up a pattern, they do it for everybody. Mm -hmm. Now you got the keys to the kingdom and that's where the phone book gets built. Yep, absolutely. Chip, do you see, or, you know, do you see this a lot when you're in, in monitoring kind of those incoming attacks? Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is one of the things that when we first onboard customers, it drives them crazy because they see a lot of password spray attack um, events going on. They think the satellites is very noisy. We actually set the noise threshold fairly low for several different events. And this is one where, you know, what we're hoping to do is raise awareness for the MSP who then in turn raises awareness for their customer. Hey, even though you're just a guy that has 50 employees and three dry cleaning shops, people are actually coming after your domain. Like, and you, you think that since you're a little business in East Jibip America, that no one's gonna bother you, it's not the case. They're looking for a way to land inside Microsoft 365 and then move horizontally from there. And what Bo just described is that first step. Hey, this is how we're gonna recon this domain, figure out the pattern that's used, and then we're gonna start going at individual usernames and now we're going to try and start cracking their password especially if they don't have mfa in it. yeah very cool thanks chip all right bob back to you yeah so another thing that we see pretty often from the outside is misconfiguration around public uh, or around storage to make them public so this is something you, you you see in the news all the time where um an organization has exposed a bucket of data um on accident so that could be something like an amazon s3 bucket azure has the same thing, they call it uh, blob storage. Um, and so, so storage on, on Azure, um, like S3, uh, you can actually brute force the, the URLs that are associated with specific accounts because they're predictable names. And so what I mean by that is when you go to create a storage account on Azure, you have to create a, um, you have to create a storage account. And in order to do that, you have to provide a name. So um, like, for example, if I were to go and create one for Black Hills, I might call it Black Hills storage account. You know, a lot of companies do that where they just call their storage account the same name as their company, right? So us as attackers, um, we would, here, I'll, I'll go back to the slide in a second. We would, we would use a tool like this to brute force uh, those subdomains. Um, so Cloudinium is a tool that we use pretty often. Um, basically what it does is it takes a keyword. So we would give it something like a company name and it will start to append and prepend various things like um, Black Hills Lab, Black Hills Dev, Black Hills Prod, um, and try to identify the storage account names uh, where uh, you know we have we have set up storage buckets, and it's very easy to go and and actually misconfigure these in Azure. Um, so when you when you set up a bucket of um, data in Azure, there's there's three ways you can do it. You can set it to private, which means there's no anonymous access, so nobody publicly could access that storage. Um, you can set it to blob, so this would be very similar to. Um, the way that you would go in and share like a file on like OneDrive or on Google Drive, where you say, I'm going to share this link. And um, if I give that link to somebody, they can access that file. However, they're not going to be able to see the rest of the files within that folder that I shared. Um, they're only going to see that one file because I created that shared link, right? And then there's container access. So if you set a storage level to container access, this means that now anybody who knows a container name can actually list out all the files within it. And this is where we, we see um, organizations that expose um, data publicly on accident, they'll set it to container access. And then from there, um, it becomes a just, it's, it's just a brute force game from the outside. So we brute force those subdomains and then um, attempt to brute force bucket names within each one of those. Um, and, and oftentimes, if an organization has exposed uh, storage externally, we might find it this way. Oh, just curious when you, when you're brute forcing, you know, and you obviously you guys will play up market pretty, you know, sophisticated, what kind of, aren't you concerned with throwing off detection in that or do, do that, you know, how do so, you guys evade that? So the thing to, to consider here is that the majority of the brute force, um, I guess, enumeration, so to speak, is, is more from a DNS perspective, um, as opposed to like hitting a specific network necessarily. 
Um, so, so think about this. Like if I were to create Black Hills storage bucket, what happens is Azure will create a DNS entry that says blackhills.storageaccount.azure.com or whatever it is, right? And so for me as an attacker, I'm literally just doing DNS lookups to try to identify ones that resolve. Got it, right? got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay. So, so it's a, it, like, it's, it's not even hitting like Azure at that point. It's hitting just a name server somewhere. <laughs> one, so to the, one of the questions Andrew asks in chat, he says, does the, uh, does this Enum uh, find open SharePoint, OneDrive, anonymous link shares, things like that as well? No. So this does not, uh, this specific tool does not work with SharePoint and um, OneDrive. Got it. Got it. <laughs> Jason's like, it's always DNS. I just saw <laughs> yes, John yep. Strand uh, live at IT Nation. And, you know, he went off doing one of his John Strand rants, you know, mm -hmm. almost Sam Kennison on DNS. Um, and uh, it, 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 I don't know if you want to try to repeat that, though, but it's it's quite the act, as you know. It, it would probably take the rest of the, uh, the time up. So, <laughs> 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 all right. So we talked about password spraying a little bit. Um, and, you know, I want to kind of like reiterate, because this is something that um, honestly is, is an attack that we use very, very often, um, all attackers do. And I like I have written multiple different tools just for password spraying, whether it be, you know, old school exchange, internal uh, domain password spraying, um, and as well as Azure. And what password spraying is, is, is almost an opposite approach to what you would consider a traditional brute force attack. So traditional brute force attacks, um, think... I have one account and I'm going to try 10,000 passwords against that one account, right? Like that's traditional brute forcing. But what happens is you end up locking out accounts that way, right? Because most account lockout policies are somewhere around like five attempts these days. So sp password spraying takes an opposite mindset and says, hey, I'm going to take all of the accounts. So uh, let's say there's a thousand uh, user accounts in an organization and I'm going to try one password against each one of those. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to try something like season year, right? So right now, fall 2022, um, eight characters, give it a capital F on the, on the front of it. You've got, you know, three of the four requirements in most cases, you got an uppercase, lowercase, a number, um, that is it's, it's, it sounds so crazy, but I, I kid you not. Um, that is something that we see on like almost every customer we, we test, whether it be season year with an exclamation point season year, just season, you know, just like that season at year, um, season year tends to be something that every single organization has at least some employee that has a password like that. If it's not that, um, company name one, two, three, um, a lot of times local sports teams um, tend to tend to be something that they get used to. Um, and why, why do we care about this, right? Like, why would we care about getting access to one account? Um, well, this is, this comes back to getting that phone book, right? The, the initial phone book access. So again, as, as external attackers, I might have 20 to 30% of your user list externally, you know, because I'm, I'm just pulling it off LinkedIn. I'm pulling it off who, whoever said they worked at your company. Right. But the second I get an actual um, employee's credentials, then I can pull the rest of the user list. And now I can do more password spraying and try to get additional access. It also provides an opportunity of doing um, internal accounts uh, phishing. So, you know, leveraging that account that I'm authenticated with to yeah, attempt to fish internally as well. Well, so if you're an MSP, let's just say they said, oh, consult with me. How critical, like, you know, just from a policy, password policy perspective, are you telling your clients, hey, look, we know most of the, you know, a lot of you guys have every 90 days, change your accounts, get away from, you know, uh, season and year. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, is that is that is that's going to be a tried and true for a threat actor, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the, the mitigations here is um, what is known as Azure password protection. Uh, so this is basically a password filter functionality within Azure. And so what this does is it allows you as an organization to say, I'm not going to allow my employees to pick seasons. I'm not going to allow them to pick my company name. I'm not going to allow them to pick mm. a lot of the common stuff. And honestly, as somebody who has done a ton of password spraying for the last nine years, um, I can tell you like taking those out of the mix significantly helps you, you know, not get password sprayed. So um, MSPs, like, yes or no, why yes and no in chat, are you guys using uh, this filter? Love to know. And if not, uh, please start using it. Go ahead, Bob. Sorry, I just really- Yeah, yeah. so I mean, yeah. so first off, length, right? Like length is the big one you hear about a lot, um, but also removing a lot of these common ones. Because what will happen is um, organizations will, uh, they'll set a policy that's like 15 characters, right? And that's that's awesome. But then employees will pick passwords like, December, December, 2022. <laughs> and they'll just use, you know, 
the same thing. It's the same like month and year, season and year, but they'll just replicate the first half of it. Um, so it does absolutely help to take out a lot of those kind of words. And if you do that, it becomes significantly harder for attackers to guess any of those. Um, the other thing is uh, called Azure Smart Lockout. And I, I briefly mentioned this. So this is, this is a way to prevent um, a specific IP address from performing any sort of authentication more than a certain number of times. And so by default, I think it's like uh, 10 attempts in one minute. Mm. So if, if I'm password spraying and I hit your environment um, over you know, 10 attempts within a minute, then it will lock out my IP address for a certain period of time. Got it. And so that's another one that like, I absolutely have, have, have turned on um, because it will help. Um, but just know that it is based off of IP address. So that is something that can be blocked if an attacker rotates IPs, which we have a tool for that too. <laughs> so authentication. So bro, oh, yeah, great, go ahead. Great, great opportunity to, to ask a question. Um, and maybe also Andrew drop this follow-up into um, a poll for the MSPs who are attending, but you know, Microsoft and Google both have released guidance um, in the past year that essentially says password change policies are not a great idea. What, what you should be training people to do is use very long, complex passphrases that they can remember, never write down, and then never change them. Because when it comes to brute force attacks, it's all about computing power, right? And, you know, eight, eight, eight figures, whether you have complexity on or not, is far weaker than 16 or 24. So the idea is to actually train your users to use a long, almost a sentence um, as a passphrase. Um, and you know, what impact does that have on you as, um, you know, as, a, as a red team hacker? Yeah, absolutely. So 100% um, long passwords over changing, um, for sure. So um, I, I would agree with that recommendation that um, I think, I think changing password every 90 days is, is a little bit much. Um, and honestly, what, what happens is employees will literally just append a character or they will um, increment a number on the end. Um, I've seen it a, a ton. Like, and at the end of the day, um, when it comes down to, to cracking passwords, um, that, that typically is like way, way later in the game. Um, you know, like it, you've already, you've already had enough compromise to the point where, um, like changing your password 90 days, isn't going to help. <laughs> um, like it's, it's good for like a long-term, um, like if you, if you assume that maybe you were compromised, um, to go ahead and change some, some passwords, but there should be other controls in play, um, to help identify any sort of abnormal logins as well. Okay. I'll tell you, John Strand, just, uh, I think his ears just lit up chip when you said passphrases, it's one of his favorite things, right, Bo? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So, um, one of the big differences between traditional on-prem networks and in Azure is the sheer number of ways that you can authenticate to it. And this is something that I, I tend to uh, focus very heavily on is where can I authenticate to in, in Azure and how can I do it? Because um, depending on the type of user account, you can also um, leverage things like certificates to authenticate. You can um, use you know, various settings around MFA, um, and there's also things like service principle credentials that allow organizations to authenticate from a programmatic uh, perspective as a way, as, as opposed to a traditional username and password. So conditional access, this is, this is, like I said, the big topic for me. Um, one of my favorite things to talk about, because this is where I tend to see the majority of, um, enterprises have some level of failure when it comes to protecting their access to Microsoft 365 specifically. Um, so first off, um, Microsoft 365 does have MFA built in, right? And it is something that is very easy to, to enable for multiple accounts. Um, there's, you know, you have the authenticator app you can leverage, you can use SMS, you can do voice calls. Um, so it is something that is already built in. You don't have to use a third party software for it. One of the, the really greatest like in my mind, greatest things about Microsoft 365 is the day that you spin up a Microsoft 365 account, um, there's something called security defaults that is enabled on all Azure AD um, users by default. And it's, it's, it's an amazing setup. So by default, when you sign up for, for an account, every user is gonna be required for MFA. It's gonna block legacy authentication protocols. So it's gonna block things like Exchange Web Services, IMAP, um, ActiveSync, um, it's going to require MFA during any auth when it's necessary. So that means um, things like um, 
like whenever a user is logging in from a new location or if it's a suspicious login. Uh, and then it will protect privilege activities like access to the Azure portal. So this is something that, um, you know, as an attacker, if we get access to the Azure portal, that can, and, you know, provide us a little bit more context than the, the, the Active Directory list there. Uh, so these are great settings, right? Now, the problem is that whenever an organization needs to create any sort of exclusion, so uh, let's say that you have a C-suite that, uh, you know, they don't want to have MFA on their mobile devices, something that happens all the time, right? Um, we see exclusions for various types of users where it's, it's hey, um, you know, I have this business case where I need to access single factor. Um, and the day that, you know, you're told that as an admin, hey, I need to create this exclusion, you have to go begin, uh, you have to go begin building things called conditional access policies. And the problem is that whenever you turn on conditional access in Azure, you have to disable security defaults. And so what happens is all these great settings that are on by default get turned off. And you now have the responsibility of going and rebuilding all these awesome security protections, right? And that's, that is like, to me, like one of the biggest things that, that I see um, as a problem uh, when it comes to setting up Microsoft environments, because, you know, if you don't go and, you know, re-implement all these great uh, security uh, configurations, then you're going to have holes. So first off, what is, what is conditional access anyway? So these are fine grain controls for creating access to resources uh, and when and where MFA is applied. So when you create a conditional access policy, you can apply it to users. You can apply it to the location they're logging in from. So that could be something like an IP address. Uh, you can apply it to the device they're using. So that could be, you know, hey, mobile devices, um, Android devices, um, uh, you know, iPhone, um, Windows, Mac. Like you can set the type of device. Uh, you can set the application they're logging in from or logging into, and then uh, real-time risk. And you can kind of say, all right, hey, here's my C-suite user that's logging in from this IP address with this device. And I'm going to allow that single factor. But what ends up happening is things like legacy auth um, get, get left off. And um, so legacy authentication is uh, things like SMTP, IMAP, Exchange Web Services. Um, these are old school ways to authenticate that actually most of them don't even support things like MFA. So for example, Exchange Web Services, if you, if you enable Exchange <clears throat> Web Services um, on your account and you have MFA enabled for your, your, the rest of your environment, um, I can authenticate to Exchange Web Services single factor. And this is something that, that we look for on every single assessment now. And um, it's something that, that still comes up pretty often. So um, a lot of times in the past, things like uh, certain clients didn't have the ability to leverage uh, modern authentication. So a uh, well, good example of that was Outlook for Mac. So if you were using Outlook for Mac, um, it could only leverage Exchange Web Services to authenticate. <clears throat> And due to that, you know, you now had an exclusion in O365 that allowed, um, you know, Exchange Web Services from these clients. And when that happens, again, like it's single factor, there is no MFA for Exchange Web Services. Oh, so basically, if I could sum up what you're saying is, as soon as we make exceptions for the C-suite, we're breaking all these great default security settings. And now we're all of a sudden, now we're in this world of managing M365 or Azure at scale, yep. um, if, if, okay. Um, there was a quick question, if I could run it by you. Um, Zachary says, and I'll try and piece it together because he says, um, does, secure, does secure score identify security defaults to re-implement when conditional access is enabled? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure what security score, scorecard, I believe is, is what they mentioned. Um, right, right, right. Yeah, I'm not sure if that actually identifies the same things that security defaults implements. Um, but uh, yeah, like that, that'd be awesome if they did. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of these things should come up because things like legacy auth, it's like uh, it was mentioned uh, by Chris says, fortunately, legacy auth is being deprecated by Microsoft, uh, though SMTP auth is still sticking around. So they've been, so, it, you know, like in the slide here, like you can see, this is actually an old slide because it said legacy auth. Uh, end of life pushed back to second half of 2021. This was, so they've been pushing it back, the end of life for legacy auth since like early 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's something that like, yes, it's supposed to go away, right? It's supposed to. However, yeah. it keeps getting pushed back. Yeah. So 
I, you know, who knows? We have seen a lot of activity around legacy auth changes and Microsoft pushing back. Um, many of our partners have called us to report the NT authority system coming in and making these changes on behalf of them. And Sadler's picked those up at events. And we've had to explain this is Microsoft doing the thing. They're finally getting around to systematically making these changes. So we, we are getting there. And Andrew, on this um, dichotomy that exists between security defaults um, and setting up conditional access policies, you may remember from several of our last savvy calls, a lot of the feedback that we've received from partners is, hey, why don't you guys give us settings inside Sazzlers to control that? So that's definitely 2023 roadmap items that are coming out where um, we're going to give the partners the opportunity to disable security defaults, but then show them each individual setting that they need to go back and look at on a per account basis, account by account, um, and let them evaluate it. So exactly the, the situation that Bo just laid out, we see this all the time. There's people in the organizations that want exceptions. Yeah. Uh, administrators try and keep up with the requests. Um, it's usually people who have higher level of authority, so they don't want to be bothered with security because they think they're immune, and that puts everybody at further risk. So we're going to try and help help the MSP community address that. Yeah, that, awesome. That, that's awesome. Awesome. It's it's Bo just kind of. I don't know if you ever heard of like, you know, some of these core banking apps, you know, like, you know, Fiserv and Jack Henry and all these things. It's it's almost like that, right? Like, you know, you go in and you change this one thing for this one teller or this one lender. And all of a sudden, like you have these cascading effects. This is how I'm just putting it together in my head, because um, that that's where, you know, those systems really um, break down too. So um, but that is it though. I got it. Just trying to, you know, put it together. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, one thing to keep in mind though, when you start looking at the settings that you recommend, right. Um, is device platforms, because this is something that I, another thing that I'm like, I, I really don't like about the way that it's described anyway. Um, so if you say that you want to allow your users to authenticate single factor from phones, like for example, Android and iOS, right. It's literally a check on the user agent that's authenticating. And why that's bad is because it's very easy to change your user agent. And so like this is a real world case uh, where we've seen this um, on engagements with actual customers where we will have fished a credential or maybe we have um, password sprayed a credential. We go to log in with a browser uh, on a desktop, right? And we get prompted for, for MFA, like the screenshot you see on the left, right? Um, however, because of a conditional access policy that says, Mobile devices can log in single factor. Uh, we change our user agent in the browser to a mobile user agent, like the screenshot on the right, and now we're signed in single factor. Um, so keep in mind that device platform check is literally a user agent check. Like it's 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 nothing too crazy to bypass. Um, so when it comes to MFA, um, one of the things that we try to do is see where it's applied and find inconsistencies across the vast majority of places you can authenticate in Azure. And um, I ended up putting together a tool called MFA Sweep that helps do this. Uh, so what it does is takes a set of credentials and attempts to authenticate to the various APIs, first of all. So the Microsoft Graph API and the Service Management API. Um, so both of these are used for um, either managing of Azure Active Directory uh, or infrastructure. And then it tries to authenticate to Exchange Web Services to cover that legacy auth box. Um, it tries to hit the web portal directly. Um, and then the web portal as a mobile user to try to cover that checkbox. Um, and then ActiveSync um, as well. Because ActiveSync, as you can see in the conditional access policy uh, check here, is actually its own checkbox uh, whenever you create a conditional access policy. So uh, check that as well. And what will happen is, you know, if an organization has set up conditional access uh, for the the vast majority of these, like the web portal, um, you know, web portal as a mobile user, but didn't cover legacy auth, then we'll see something like single factor um, access to Exchange Web Services. And, you know, the thing about legacy protocols like Exchange Web Services is it's very much the same level of content we can access. It's, you know, it's email access um, and, you know, allows us to perform other attacks from that specific point of view. Um, so, you know, if you did want to test this out, I, you know, have the script. It's uh, there's a link here on GitHub. Um, just be careful because it is authenticating seven times to whatever account you give it. So, 
this one also, so it also does check ADFS as well. So if you do have ADFS uh, implemented, it will attempt to authenticate there as well. So post compromise. Um, so as attackers, what are some of the first things that we would want to do? Like if we compromise the credential, right? Now, let's say that we found uh, single factor access somewhere, or we we've, maybe we fished a credential and um, you know got through the entire uh, session uh, process and actually are sitting with a set of cookies now, um, as opposed to just a set of credentials, even if MFA is enabled. Um, what can we do, right? So what do we what do we access or what do we have access to? What roles do we have? So we try to identify um, uh, more information, right? So it becomes recon again. What can we get to? Is MFA enabled in all places or is it just on this one spot? Um, I try to focus heavily on resources if we can, um, because if we can access things like web apps, if we can access things like storage accounts um, from an authenticated perspective, that tends to be really fruitful for, as an attacker. Um, you know, it was mentioned SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, you know, can we ex access that externally? Once you're authenticated, mm -hmm. then it becomes very easy to just navigate to SharePoint and start performing searches from there. Um, so that is one of the first things I would do as an attacker. Hit SharePoint, try to find any sensitive files. Um, who are the admins and how are we going to escalate to admin? Can we identify paths of escalation? Um, you know, I teach a six, 16 hour course on this and it, like I can't put a whole lot of like the privilege escalation stuff in this specific one, but um, basically there are methods, um, cloud specific methods of achieving escalation within an account. Um, it just depends on what account you initially have access to and what the organization has configured um, to, uh, to, to help protect against escalation and then so, are there any oh good yeah I was just ask you like you know obviously post uh covid where we've got teams and all these other you know services has it enabled you to compromise accounts easier uh i wouldn't say easier necessarily um it's just it's different um so <clears throat> i would say even prior to covid um a lot of organizations were migrating to microsoft 365 anyway Right. And so we, we were still like on the, like the cusp of attacking Microsoft 365 exclusively for the most part anyway. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, with things like teams, um, people have become much more used to, uh, you know, receiving messages as opposed to, um, emails. Right? right. And so that's, you know, from a phishing perspective, um, a lot of the, the actual phishing techniques have kind of m moved more towards the, out of the box type of approach and not just sending an email anymore. Um, it tends to be, hey, can we actually send a message to this person? Or can we um, send them a text message uh, as opposed to you know, just sending them an email? Because there's so much scrutiny, scrutiny on, um, on email these days um, that right. honestly, messaging platforms like Teams have become really useful for attackers. Uh, I was just curious because doesn't it also then spin up SharePoint automatically when you open up a Teams and you know a lot a lot of things also get configured in the background and I was just wondering if that pervasiveness helps an attacker. Yeah, I mean, um yeah, I, I would say yes. Yes it does. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you there. Oh no, it's all good. Uh like I said, please please ask as many questions as you want. Um so one of the first things I would do after getting access to an account is determine, can I get access to the Azure portal? Um, and the reason is because, so it's, it's nice to see that I have access to email, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and assume that most employees have Outlook access because most typically do most typically have SharePoint access. One of the things that I'm curious about though, as an attacker is, can I get access to the Azure portal? And from an authenticated session um, to, to Microsoft 365, it's literally just directing your browser to portal.azure.com. Um, and you can lock it down as an admin. You can um, you know, make it so that authenticated users can't access the Azure portal directly, um, which is a nice, it's a nice uh, benefit um, to, to, to using Azure. Um, because as an attacker, if I can't authenticate to the Azure portal, um, there are, you know, that, that, that can help prevent me from enumerating the directory or enumerating things like service principles. Um, so that can, that can be helpful. Um, but as an attacker, it's also a good place for me to go look to see very quickly if the account that I've compromised has access to any subscriptions. And why that's, why that's important is because um, a user who has access to a subscription usually, usually means that they have been provided some level of permissions within the infrastructure environment, right? So if, let's say that I were to maybe have compromised, um, you know, somebody who is a dev, um, and maybe that dev has 
their own subscription in, in their Azure tenant, that they're spinning up resources. Um, like that could be really, really fruitful for me as an attacker. Um, av you know, al alternatively, um, if let's say that, you know, the Azure portal is locked down, command line access is the next best thing. Um, so there's a number of uh, APIs that you can talk to uh, from the, um, when, you're, when you're communicating with Azure resources. So you have PowerShell modules, AZ, you have the Azure um, AD and MS Online PowerShell modules as well. There's a CLI tool that's cross-platform called the AZ CLI that's really good. Um, if you guys, I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna dive into it today, but if you guys are interested in like seeing some of the commands that we would run, I actually put together um, a repo out there called Cloud Pentest Cheat Sheets. And honestly, like this would be a great thing to just like um, probably alert off of, <laughs> um, you know, like I, I, I talk about it in my class, but um, you know, when I, let's say that we compromise the system with, you know, EDR that's well, well configured. Um, a lot of times things like who am I, right? Like just running a command, like who am I or net users um, to enumerate information gets flagged, right? Um, so a lot of the initial recon commands you would use on the cloud side are probably good things to alert off of as well. So just uh, something to think about there. Leveraging scanning tools. Um, so from my point of view uh, as an attacker, you know, in most cases, I don't wanna be too noisy. Right, especially if it's a red team, especially if it's something where I'm trying to be evasive in any extent. Um, but that being said, uh, there are definitely assessments we do where we want to find everything. Right, we want to find every best practice issue that an, an organization has. And there's a few open source tools out there that can help us find things like, um, you know, standard IAM permission issues, things like public availability of, of resources. So, like, this is one that, that I think is actually really interesting from an authenticated context because. You know, as an outsider, uh, like we were doing um, earlier, we we're brute forcing and trying to identify what we could externally. That doesn't always work, right? Because there might be things that are named, things that we're not guessing. Um, but once you're authenticated uh, to, to any cloud API, as long as you have the permissions on um, things like uh, S3 or things like on um, Azure storage, uh, you can enumerate the public availability of those resources as well, and then go check them and determine whether or not they're serving up like sensitive content. So. Um, Scout Suite's a tool that I typically tend to, to use at least just for an initial scan to get like some best practice issues. Um, it will help find a lot of those common things um, that will just you know provide at least a starting point uh, for uh, for configuration problems. Works for AWS, Azure, GCP. Um, and then I also added a slide here near the end um, just to kind of throw out a bunch of other Azure tools that we tend to use on assessments. Um, so. These might be good things for not only organizations to just run and see what they see, but also on the alerting side, um, you know, they tend to be noisy, right? So things like road tools, uh, the, the, the first link I have here, I was actually just talking to the author this morning because um, I, was, I was using his tool on an engagement um, today. And it's, it's great because uh, like if the Azure portal is locked down, um, like I mentioned earlier, right? Like where I'm trying to navigate it with the browser, you can actually leverage road tools to go and pull all the same data down from the API and then rebuild it in a, a local graphic interface. Um, so it makes it, it makes it nice as, as a, uh, a way of getting access to that data and looking through it without actually having access to the portal. So anyways, um, there's a few uh, extra resources there. Um, and then key takeaways, uh, you know, like I mentioned, recon is key to understanding cloud asset usage. So like right up front, you know, like that's the best place I think to identify um, attackers who are who are trying to get into an organization is their recon step because they tend to be noisy, um, tend to be uh, trying to get access to things that maybe are a little too evident. Like for example, um, like storage bucket named the company name, right? That might be a, that might be a good place to to put a canary, right? Like put your canary in a public storage bucket that has your company name, right? Um, cloud attack surface enables multiple ways to gain access. Um, so, you know, multiple APIs, multiple places to authenticate, multiple places to lock down. Uh, configuration of cloud resources is still a wild west. It really is. Things are changing daily. Um, there's still like exploits that are happening where um, we're still seeing stuff that honestly we shouldn't even be seeing like at this point. So like segmentation between customers on Azure, like exploits, like that's bad. Like whenever Azure, like an Azure resource itself can be exploited. And then from that, that, um, that initial foothold, like actually pivot over to other Microsoft customers, like that's bad. Um, that's still <laughs> happening though. <laughs> Seriously, like that's, um, 
it like those types of things like you you would think that like there'd be segmented off enough that you couldn't actually do that but it still happens um and then key methods for gaining a foothold for us uh, as attackers tend to be key disclosure and repos so think uh credentials and code that gets posted publicly to things like github password attacks like password spraying phishing of credentials from users still big one um and then uh remote code execution of resources we, we, you know, oftentimes web applications still tend to have vulnerabilities that allow things like command injection. Um, so that can be a good way for attackers to get in as well. And then after the fact, situational awareness. So um, a lot of those commands that I, I listed in the um, Cloud Pentest cheat sheets, things I'm going to run after getting access. So um, that's that's it for me. Um, what questions you guys got? We you can hit me with all the questions. <laughs> that, that was awesome. One question that Stephen had back when you were doing passwords that I didn't get to, but I will, Stephen Hicks. So he said, back to Azure AD password protection, there is a global ban P PW list in Azure. Are you suggesting a custom one or something else? Um, I would say do what makes sense um, in your organization. Um, and so the 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 list that's already there should cover a lot of the basic stuff. Um, but so from my point of view, as, as an attacker, these are the things that I would, I would try to prevent um, if, I were, if I were to implement a filter. Um, first off, seasons, right? That's a big one. Yep. Months is another one. Um, company name and, and iterations of the company name. And then um, finally, sports teams. Like, that ten, like those four... Um, we'll cover a lot of common password choices at any organization. Yeah, very cool. Um, uh, Ken asks where we, where your cheat sheets might be, Bo. Are they posted out there somewhere? Yeah, so they're in the slide deck. Um, I don't know. Did, were you going to pass the slides out or, or post them somewhere? Or we'll, I can? we'll get the uh, yeah, we'll we'll take yeah. care of it. I got it. Yeah, can we? Um, can, is it okay to share your slide deck here, Bo? Yeah, please do. Yeah, okay, great. So we'll make sure we get it to everybody because there's a lot of people asking for it. Okay. Cool. Perfect. Chip, um, any thoughts or takeaways you might have as we close out? No, I mean, look, folks, first off, thanks. That's a fantastic presentation. You know, all, so much of your information dovetails with the mission that, that we're trying to provide and, and make managing these things uh, easier for MSPs. The other observation I'd make that something that, that we focus on very, very closely is um, how data is shared, especially external from the organization. And we're constantly trying to impress upon people that, you know, even the most innocuous thing being shared anonymously in a file is really dangerous because it can lead, it's a way into that phishing section. And the example I use is one from my past around someone that shared an anonymous file um, that was all about a company picnic and it had everybody's names in it um, and everybody's email addresses in it. And, and the reaction that they had to me calling that out was, well, there's nothing in there that's important. And, you know, because they don't think of it as sensitive information. Everybody knows their email address. But it's that kind of stuff that the, that are the little keys that lead to targeting phishing attacks and help, you know, the hacker get a leg up. And I, and I love the way you present this, you know, as someone who is a hands-on uh, paid attacker to go out and probe for this. And, you know, I'd love for you to comment on the importance of people really locking down the data side, even things that they think, are completely innocuous. Yeah, absolutely. And so even so on that specific topic, right on the on the topic of exposing usernames. Um, so like I mentioned on let's see, where's the password spraying slide I passed it, I think. Um, so so like I said, like one of the first things that we will do here we go password spraying um, is password spray, right. And on Azure, uh, the, like it, the the ability to password spray in Azure is so verbose. Uh, the error messages you get when you don't actually have a real account um, that it can actually lead to you understanding a very, very uh, large amount about what the organization configured around conditional access. And so let's say that let's say that I had an entire valid uh, email list right off the front. Um, I can attempt to password spray against those accounts. And one thing is if I have a valid credential, first of all, so let's say that, let's say somebody chose season year, right? And I see that it's valid. However, MFA is enabled. Um, that can allow me to um, see a message like this. This is actually the exact message you would see where it says, um, due to configuration changed by your uh, administrator or because you moved to a new location, you must use multi-factor authentication to access, blah, blah, blah. So 
why this is so so little things like this, right? Why that's important is because um, this is not actually triggering MFA. However, it is it is telling me as an attacker that MFA is enabled, and so from that context, I'm not in like making the process of the user um, getting a text message or them getting a call happen, right? Like I know about it, but the user's not actually getting that that email address or they're not getting that email or that text, right? And so now I, I have a, a an opportunity to make a decision whether or not I want to try to prey on that, um, uh, what's called uh, MFA uh, fatigue. Have you, have you heard that term? Um, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so like the idea is like, you know, the, people are, triggering MFA all day long for various stuff that they just like allow stuff in. Um, so us as pen testers, we do it all the time where we'll see something like this and we're like, okay, well, let's try it. Like midday during lunch while they're busy, um, you know, where, where they're, you know, not, you know, like they don't have a whole lot of time to really like think about it and we will trigger it and somebody will just let us in to their account. Um, so yeah, the more information we have as attackers, the better. Right, and so anything extra, things like email address, things like MFA implementations, things like, um, especially things people post on LinkedIn. Um, so we see a lot of employees post like, like security people will post, hey, I'm, uh, you know, five years efficient at, you know, this EDR product, you know, and things like that. And it tells us as attackers what we need to get around. So hope, does that answer your question? It, it's definitely the commentary I was looking for. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> so I know we're at a few minutes over. Jim, you want to close us out here? Um, man, what a great audience we had. I'm I'm so, so psyched about this. Bo, thank you for everything, by the way. Absolutely. It was, yeah. 